welcome to this very important press conference that we have here in Newton County. Um, I'm going to give you the basic overview of what has transpired today in the history of this case. And then after I've concluded my comments, I'm going to have District Attorney of Yuba County, Patrick McGrath, come forward to also offer some other information that we think is vital to you. Um, I also want to make sure that before you part that you get a copy of our press packet there. It has uh, pictures of the victim, uh, an overview of the geographical area of where the homicide had occurred, uh, in addition to a press release and all of that information being on the thumb drive for you. Uh, earlier today, the Yuba County Sheriff's uh, Office detectives, along with the assistance of the United States Marshals uh, Fugitive Task Force, in addition to other law enforcement uh, agencies in Oklahoma, arrested two individuals, Larry Don Patterson, age 65, of Oakhurst, Oklahoma, and William Lloyd Harbor, age 65, of all of First California, for the November 1973 murder of two young Yuba County girls, Valerie Janice Lane, age 12, and Doris Karen Derryberry, age 13, both of all of First. On Sunday, November 11th, in 1973, Valerie and Dave and Doris uh, were together when they left Doris's home around noon to go shopping. Based on statements taken by investigators in 1973, witnesses reported seeing the girls around Marysville, Linda, and Oliverhurst throughout that afternoon. They were last sighted on November 11th, 1973, in the area of Oliverhurst and 7th Avenue between approximately 8.30 and 9 p.m. When the girls failed to return home on Monday, November 12th, the mothers of these young girls reported their daughters as possible runaways. At approximately 2 p.m. on November 12th, Yuba County Sheriff's Office deputies and detectives were dispatched to meet with the Wheatland Police Department in an area located down a dirt road off of Camp Far West Road at a location approximately four-tenths of a mile near the Bear River. Sheriff's Office detectives were directed to this location after two local residents had been in that area hunting when they discovered the young female bodies. They had reported their finding to the Wheatland Police Department who responded and in turn called us as it was the Sheriff's Department's jurisdiction. The victims were later, later identified as Valerie Lane and Doris Derryberry. Both girls had been killed by close range shotgun wounds and there was evidence indicating that one of the girls had been sexually assaulted. There was a very intensive investigation conducted into the murders of Valerie and Doris from 1973 well into 1976. Despite a tremendous investigative effort with meticulous crime scene processing, evidence collection, and nearly 70 interviews conducted, no successful leads were developed back then. There remained an unsolved homicide for decades. And it was in March of 2014 that Yuba County Sheriff's Office investigators reviewed the case for any possible evidence that could be developed utilizing modern forensic techniques and analysis that was not available in 1973. And items of evidence that were collected during the original investigation were reviewed and submitted to the California Department of Justice Forensic Lab for analysis. In December of 2014, testing by the California Department of Justice revealed DNA biological evidence collected during the autopsy examination of Doris Derryberry. This DNA evidence was matched and identified as belonging to two suspects, Larry Patterson and William Harbour. We actively reopened this investigation at that time, thoroughly reviewed the entire 1973 investigation case file, conducted investigations into the background of the suspects, relocated witnesses and investigators that may still be around that were involved in the original case, and followed up on several aspects of this case. After an extensive, extensive and expanded investigation, Yuba County Sheriff's Office detectives presented the case to the Yuba County District Attorney's Office for review and later the issuance of arrest warrants for Patterson and Harbor. Harbor was 22 at the time of the murders and remained in the Yuba Center area all this time. He was taken into custody today at about 10.30 a.m. on a traffic stop by our detectives and sheriff's deputies in the area of Edgewater and Rupert Avenue in Linda, California. Patterson was also 22 years of age at the time of the murders, lived in Oliverhurst during the time that these murders had occurred. He was taken into custody today at approximately 10.45 a.m. Central Time at his residence at the 7,000 block of West 62nd Street in Oakhurst, Oklahoma. I think it's really important 
to express our sympathy, our condolences, and our hearts and prayers going out to the families of Valerie and Doris that have endured decades of suffering and grief for not knowing who was responsible for the brutal murder of their loved ones. Today we truly hope that what has transpired brings some level of closure to them if that's even possible. And I gotta tell you, great credit is deserving to the investigators involved in the case in 1973. They conducted extraordinary attention to detail, a very meticulous investigation, very meticulous handling of evidence and the packaging of vital evidence, which preserved key forensic evidence that proved of value today. And this was them having the forewarning of knowing that such advancements were, weren't even invented back in 1973 and they didn't know what was on the horizon. And it was pivotal in solving this case today. I wish to extend a great thank you and appreciation to my detectives and my staff and deputies, the California Department of Justice, the U.S. Marshal's Office, the Tulsa County Sheriff's Office, the Tulsa Police Department, the Oklahoma Department of Corrections, and the Broken Arrow Police Department for their tireless work in helping us solve an almost 43-year-old murder of these young girls. And I pray justice is finally served on those that were responsible. At this time, I'll have Yuba County District Attorney Patrick McGrath, please come forward. Thanks, Steve. So my name is Patrick McGrath. I'm the Yuba County District Attorney. Last name is spelled M-C, capital G-R-A-T-H. So Sheriff Durfer and I this morning met with surviving family members of both Valerie and Doris. And as you can expect, it was an emotional meeting. They have known that the investigation had been reopened. We were not able to share with them details as this investigation progressed. And I can tell you, as a prosecutor for 32 years, it gave me a great deal of satisfaction to be able to meet with those family members and finally tell them that we believed that we had developed the evidence that revealed who had killed their daughters. William Harbor is currently in the Yuba County Jail. I anticipate that he will be arraigned tomorrow in the Yuba County Courthouse at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He is being charged with numerous counts of murder, one count of premeditated murder, one count of felony murder committed in the perpetration of a rape, and one count of felony murder in the perpetration of of a child molest. Mr. Patterson is in custody in Oklahoma. He has a right to an extradition hearing. When that extradition hearing occurs in Oklahoma, he'll either waive extradition or we will cooperate with the Oklahoma authorities in securing an order to take him back or bring him back to California. I do not know when we can anticipate that hearing process to conclude. There's a lot of challenges in a cold case. And I can tell you, a case like this is 43 years old. One of the challenges is, who's still alive that were witnesses in 1973? Members of the investigative team have passed on. Other witnesses who were contacted in 1973 have passed on. To give you one important example, the forensic pathologist in 1973 who conducted the autopsies on Valerie and Doris has passed on. So one of the challenges that we faced from a legal standpoint was how do we get the evidence that Pierce Rooney, Dr. Pierce Rooney, collected in 1973 to pass evidentiary muster now at this age? We've been able to do that. We are extremely confident in our ability to present the forensic evidence. Over the last year, we have worked with Sheriff's Office detectives to ensure that from an evidentiary standpoint, we're in a position to go forward, and like Sheriff Durfer said, in a position to finally bring justice to Doris Derriberry and Valerie Lane. Steve? Time we'll answer any questions, questions. that you may have. Those. Go ahead, go ahead. Can you discuss, I know it's DNA evidence, but was it old uh, pieces of evidence or things from the scene at the time? Can you talk about the process of going back and being able to actually solve Sure. You know, the, 
the sheriff was absolutely right on when he complimented his investigators from 1973. They did an absolutely fantastic job of documenting the scene, and his agency did a fantastic job in preserving the evidence. So in particular, the biological evidence that was taken from Doris included semen. And so that is what was subjected to DNA analysis now by the Department of Justice that resulted in the DNA matching to both Patterson and to Harbor. So it was um, just on Doris, or was it? It was just, just Doris. And both men's DNA? Yes. Okay. The men, were there, were there, were they in the system already? Was there, was there DNA in the system already? How, yes. how did that connect? Yeah, that's a good question. So both Mr. Patterson and Mr. Harbor had been previously arrested and imprisoned. And as you know, DNA is collected from people who go into the state prison system. So both had what we call profiles in the national DNA database. So what we were able to do when the Department of Justice was able to extract this new DNA, they were able to then put it into the system to see if there was a match. And indeed, we have a match. Now, there's additional forensic work that we will do to confirm that. But at this point, this is a standard protocol for any cold hit case like this. Are there other cold cases um, from this county that you guys are looking to link these suspects to now that you have them and know kind of where they fit in the big, big here? At this point in time, we don't have any any particular cold case that is that that is inferring us directly to them. Um, certainly, as we look into future cases, we do have some unsolved homicides from some time ago. And certainly take that into consideration, but nothing that's at our attention at this time. Sure, can you talk about prior records a little bit of whether the prison system? Can you speak in the microphone, please? Thank oh, you, sir. Thank, sorry. thank, thank you. Can I just one second? Just one second. Yeah, I've got uh, more of the information in here. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Your question again, sir? Uh, you mentioned there, well, I think you had mentioned there prior to the system on uh, because of priors. Can you walk us, why were they in prison the first time around? Right. The, DNA, the DNA evidence for uh, Mr. Harbor was in the system from a, 19, uh, a 1997 uh, drug arrest, felony drug arrest, uh, and then in addition to a 2003 felony conviction for some drug offenses in Sutter County. Uh, Mr. Harbor, or I'm sorry, Mr. Patterson, uh, DNA evidence was uh, in the system. He was involved in a 1976 uh, arrest of two, murder, or two rape charges in Butte County. Um, he was convicted of those in 1980 and did do time in prison for those two rape charges. Uh, and he uh, is a um, uh, sex offender, um, and uh, he has a previous arrest in 2006 in Yuba County uh, for failing to comply with sex registration laws. Adult rape on that one? That's correct. Adult rape of two females in Chico in 1976. Mm -hmm. Just to clarify, both men's semen were found on this. Only one has violent, the other has non-violent That is program. correct. The DNA analysis from the Department of Justice identified both individuals, Harbor and Patterson's um, DNA. And anything they're telling you at this point as far as what happened in the cooperation and anything that says what, what led to this whole I think we're way, way too early in the investigation to actually comment about anything. Now remember, both individuals were just taken into custody this morning. So there's a process that goes through in terms of a booking and then contacting individuals if they wish to be interviewed. So we're not really at that point yet. Can you see what their reaction was this morning when they were arrested? Having not been on scene, I can't tell you. Okay. Don't know. Okay. You mentioned that uh, running a little bit on the reaction of the families. Can you sort of walk us a little bit through that uh, when, they, when you did that? You know, we had members of both the Derryberry and the Lane family uh, meet with the sheriff, myself, other members of the prosecution team, and Yuba County victim witness this morning in my office. And there's a wide range of people in the family. Um, we obviously have some folks who are elderly that have waited for something for 43 years for an answer as to what's happened with their kids. We have younger members of the family we even had a grandchild there, a little girl. She was about four years old. Uh, so, I mean, there's a wide range of emotions, I can tell you. Overwhelmingly, I think the older people that we were talking with 
had a sense, as they said, one of them said closure. Uh, I told her, I said, no, we've just started that process. But just the idea that they were able to actually put names and know that there was somebody been arrested that was alleged to have committed these crimes, it, it was a big deal for them. It was a big deal. Did any of them know those two people? Now, Olivehurst, 43 years ago, was a very small community. Still small, but very small. And yes, one of our suspects, Mr. Harbor, is still living in Olivehurst. He lives in the vicinity of members of one of the other families. We did talk about that with family members this morning. Inevitably, there will be contact between the various families, and you know, it's a situation that we had to talk to them about. There'll be a lot of frustration, there'll be a lot of anger, uh, a lot of things that we need to be concerned about. And what, what started this? I mean, you know, I understand you opened it up, but did, was there, somebody came up to you and said, hey, you know, or is it, hey, let's look at old cases? There was nothing in particular that, that uh, drew our attention to looking specifically back into this case. Over time, anyone that's been assigned to our investigations unit uh, for any length of time you know, looks into some of the unsolved cases that we have. And this was one uh, in particular that one of our investigators um, had, a, had a bit of free time uh, and really looked very closely uh, at this case and identified that, hey, we should send some things off and see what it might re uh, yield for us. And uh, we've shared with you what that yielded. So approximately, would, oh, ahead, uh, approximately how many cases have you also been looking at uh, that are closed files right now? Um, are there any I can't give you an exact number. I would say that th there's a handful of others that we are periodically, in addition to incoming cases that are happening sure, sure. you know, each day. Um, we're, we're always attentive to a handful of cases and certainly and being aware of what's in our, our archives that we uh, certainly want to get to and, and act on as we have on this one. I don't know how big, Don, I don't know how big the extended families are. I can tell you that my recollection, I think we had four or five members of the Lane family this morning, and we probably had 12 or so members of the Derryberry family. Yeah. And you have to remember that this was on short notice. I mean, these arrests occurred this morning, and as we tried to plan this out, the first concern we had was to bring the families in to tell them what was happening. I think you can understand that. The last thing we would want is for them to learn what had happened from an outside source and not from us. So logistically, it was difficult to actually contact all these folks and bring them in on such short notice. We're very pleased that Steve's folks were able to actually accomplish that. Can you tell us a little bit about the suspects and their families? I mean, they have families after 43 years. Uh, what kind of lives were they leading? I, you know, I don't know that I can speak, speak to the extent of the family of the suspects. Um, I know that uh, Mr. Patterson has family members that are in the uh, uh, Oakhurst, uh, Oklahoma area um, that reside in the vicinity of where he was residing and was arrested this morning. Um, and we're aware that he has some family members in California. Um, uh, Mr. Harbor, um, I understand, does have some family members that are still local in the area as well. Um, but beyond that, I can't speak to that point. It's my understanding they're cousins. Since that identification has been made, maybe what, two years ago now, has that jogged any memories, if you will, for, for witnesses um, to say that maybe new information has come since an identification has been made of the suspects? Over the last uh, about a year and a half or so that we have been running with this investigation since the DOJ results, um, there has been a um, a refreshing and a re-recollection of a lot of information from some of the witnesses that we've been able to identify in the area. Uh, and um, maybe a bit new information that has come forward that um, certainly wasn't reflected in the 1973 case that we can find at this point. Um, so there's been a bit of new evidence that has come um, forward, um, but a lot of re-recollection um, of, of um, information from the past. So. Go ahead. You know, I was born and raised.
raised in Sacramento, and I was in high school in 1973. And I can recall this case being covered back then in 1973. Put it in perspective for a minute. I hate to say this, but nowadays, these crimes seem to be commonplace. I mean, a crime like this gets some media attention for two or three days and then it drops off because there's a whole boatload of additional similar crimes that seem to occur. And so back in 1973, though, this simply didn't happen. And for the All First community, you know, it was fairly shocking. And in the time frame of 1973, if you think about it, I mean, this received a lot of media attention, both locally, Sacramento, and outside of California. So this was, as I said, this was a, this was a big deal. It still is, obviously. No, they're all, that's right, they all remain local, that's right. And you have to remember, I mean, the question was, gee, over the last year and a half, one of the challenges for Steve's folks has been to try to quietly locate witnesses, determine who was alive and who was not alive, who was available, and do so without attracting too much attention, because the last thing we wanted was for the suspects to get wind that the case had been reopened in a major fashion and somehow then endanger our ability to find them. One of the real challenges has been with Mr. Patterson, and that is locating him. We received a great deal of assistance from the U.S. Marshals on that, but we literally were looking in five different states to find him. Was there any indication that they knew this was being investigated? I don't know that we really know. I mean, we, we, we clearly know that back in 1973, they, they had a close relationship. Uh, somewhere along the way, that certainly seemed to have dropped off. We don't have any current information to indicate they have had ongoing growing contact with uh, each other. Um, and we can't tell at what point they had even last communicated with each other. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Again, yeah. I want to remind you. Thank you. Short notice. I'm sorry. The, yeah. the press packet over here. Uh, please make sure that you grab one before you, you go. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Sheriff Steve Durfer. S T E V E. Last name is D U R F O R. And tomorrow at the arraignment, I anticipate we'll have copies of the criminal complaint for anybody. Who yeah. Your name, sir. Yeah. Patrick McGrath. M C. Capital G R A T H. And you're in No, he won't be extradition. Right. He would go before a court process in Oklahoma, and part of that is he's informed of what the charges are in California. He'll have an opportunity to either waive a hearing or he can ask for an extradition hearing, which is a process of essentially presenting the California complaint and warrant to an Oklahoma judge showing that Mr. Patterson is in fact the person that California wants.